Well, as Dr. Seymour said, this is a precedent-setting meeting of the Second Language uh, Research Forum. Precedent-setting in that for the first time, it's not being convened in my town. And as I was sitting at the beach on Waikiki this afternoon, it occurred to me how grateful I am to the students in the department of ESL for making this meeting possible. One of the many tasks they had was to choose the plenary speakers for the conference, and they have done an excellent job on all choices, but especially on the choice for the opening session, Professor Dick Schmidt, chairman of the department, and tough teacher <laughs> who made them go to class at 10.30 this morning when there was so much to do on the SLURF <laughs> meeting this afternoon. Dick is somewhat of a precedent setter himself. Do you know anyone else who was a dean before he got his PhD? Do you know anyone else who wrote his dissertation on stylistic variation in Egyptian Arabic before he went to Cairo to do his field work? <laughs> Dick did. <laughs> Dick is not only precedent setting, he's also smart. When he finished his PhD in Providence, Rhode Island in 1976, he came directly from there to Hawaii where he had the sense to settle. He shows his smarts in academic arena also, being knowledgeable about such fields as sociolinguistics, second language acquisition, language teaching, language assessment, the stock market, and probably a few things I don't know about. It is this interesting and varied background that he brings to his task tonight, the task of talking about the role of consciousness in second language learning. Let's um, bring him on. Huh? I decided when I was invited to give a plenary that there was probably no better place to present a, 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 a topic of wide scope and uh, probably a dangerous one than a, a conference like this. So I chose what I thought would be a fairly uh, ambitious project. It seems to me that there are probably few issues in the field of second language acquisition about which there are uh, is such diversity of opinion as the role of consciousness in second language learning. On the one hand, there are people who either believe or teach as if they believed that errors are the result of not knowing the rules, forgetting them, or paying attention, and that conscious knowledge of the rules of a language is necessary and maybe even a sufficient condition for producing correct forms and using them appropriately. Other people firmly believe that language learning is essentially and almost completely unconscious. Herb Seliger, who I look forward to seeing in the audience tonight, has claimed that, quote, obviously it is at the unconscious level that language learning takes place. Kevin Gregg, who's out there somewhere, um, has criticized Stephen Krashen for his distinction between acquisition and learning especially the claim that learning can never become acquisition, but agrees with Krashen's uh, basic point that there is a basic distinction between conscious and unconscious knowledge and mental processes, agrees that most language learning is unconscious, and asks, but then does anyone, anybody disagree? A third commonly held position, also represented in this audience, is that the issue of consciousness really is not something that should be talked about in second language acquisition. For some people, this is a matter of caution. Many researchers assert, attribute mental processes or mental states to learners and carefully point out that no claim about consciousness is being made. For others, it's more a matter of, of principle. McLaughlin, Rossman, and McLeod, for example, 
argue against Krashen's distinction between learning and acquisition as the basis of second language learning theory precisely because it rests on the fragile and unsupportable distinction between conscious and unconscious knowledge. In a similar vein, in a very recent article discussing explicit and implicit knowledge, Audlin recommends divorcing these notions completely from what he calls the notoriously slippery notion of consciousness. There's clearly no consensus in the field on the role of consciousness in second language learning, but it seems to me that the central tendency is towards skepticism. I think that relatively few people need to be convinced that unconscious processes play a role in second language learning, while many are not convinced of a role for conscious processes. And I think to a certain extent, this may be influenced or attributed to pre-existing biases or general philosophical positions, because the question of consciousness is far from being just a second language uh, issue and must be seen in a more general cultural context. None of us have been isolated from the major intellectual trends of the 20th century, most of which have been hostile to consideration of the role of consciousness in human behavior and learning. Behaviorists, of course, were committed to the total elimination of the concept of consciousness from explanations of behavior. And although behaviorism is discredited in many circles, the basic arguments put forth by behaviorists are still heard. The basic behaviorist position is that consciousness and mental processes in general are epiphenomenal, playing no role in behavior and learning. Behaviorists also argued that, the, that consciousness, the concept of consciousness and the term consciousness is a meaningless pre-scientific term uh, with about the same status as ether or karma or soul, a position that's still presented by some analytic philosophers. Behaviorists also, also originated the frequently expressed methodological objection that because consciousness is internal and subjective, it cannot be observed. And although individuals think that they have privileged access to their own mental processes, introspection, a common way of investigating uh, subjective awareness, is generally called, quote, notoriously unreliable. Equally influential voices have advanced the view that conscious states and processes are simply less interesting than unconscious ones. Freud, Freud's most general claim that unconscious processes are ubiquitous and complex is universally accepted and is certainly supported by current research in cognitive psychology. To give a language example, when we listen or read a sentence uh, in our native language, we become aware of its meaning but we are normally completely unaware of the complex decoding process that has gone on before uh, we achieve meaning. And specifically with respect to language, Chomsky's claim that a language is generated by rules and principles that are both in unconscious and in principle inaccessible to introspection has achieved overwhelming acceptance within linguistics. In second language fields, it is virtually an article of faith also that what is acquired is not just a cognitive skill, but an implicit mental grammar, that is, an unconscious mental grammar that is most clearly reflected in learner intuitions, less directly in learner performance, and least directly in learners' conscious beliefs and statements about their use of language. In spite of all of this, the time might be right for some serious, careful consideration of the phenomenon of consciousness and the role it may play in language learning. In psychology, the decline of behaviorism starting in the 1960s led to widespread recognition that consciousness is an important concept and may be necessary for the explanation of certain psychological phenomena, followed by an outpouring of research and theory that's not particularly well known in the second language field, but which offers numerous suggestions about some relevant questions to, it, to be asked. The mainstream point of view in current cognitive psychology does not, in, in my view, support the position that subjective awareness is epiphenomenal, and it's frequently claimed that learning without awareness is impossible. Chomsky's made the point that unconscious universals, uh, that most in interest linguists, may be of little consequence to second language learners who are concerned more 
less with universals within, than with the ways that the foreign language departs from them and from the rules of the target of the native language, matters that are not innate and that require careful attention. In the second language field, some of the issues related to consciousness raised by Krashen have been widely discussed. And useful suggestions and observations have been offered by many people, including some in this audience, if I mention just a few, Bialystok, Bialystok and Bouchard Ryan, Carol, Andy Cohen, Ferk and Casper, uh, Holstein and Holstein, O'Malley, Shomo and Walker, Rutherford, Sharwood Smith, and Van Patten among others. What I'd like to convince you of tonight is that a concept of consciousness is desirable, respectful, respectable, useful, and maybe even necessary for understanding second language learning. I think that inclusion of a, of a role for consciousness in language learning is desirable because consciousness is so closely related to our concepts of ourselves. In fact, the shifting flow of perceptions, thoughts, feelings, plans, desires that constitutes the stream of consciousness is our experience of life. So if consciousness is left out of the language of our descriptions of the language learning process completely, we run the risk of leaving the language learner out of the process. I'd like to convince you that consciousness is a respectable notion because of a large body of research, much, much of it experimental, mostly from the field of psychology. I'd like to claim that it's useful because it ties together many related concepts, such as attention, short-term memory, controlled versus automatic processing, and serial versus parallel processing. I will also claim that a concept of consciousness is probably, probably necessary in order to resolve some difficult issues in second language acquisition, and may be a necessary condition for some steps in the language learning process, facilitative in others. It's not my purpose to, dis to deny an important role to unconscious processes in second language learning, but I think that assertions that second language learning is exclusively or almost exclusively or essentially uh, unconscious probably contain hidden assumptions regarding the, the, the essence of learning. For example, that second language learning is by definition the establishment of, a, of an implicit grammar. I think a more reasonable but more difficult approach is to assume that both conscious and unconscious processes are involved and to try to assess and evaluate the relative contribution of each. In order to do that, we need to have, first of all, a clearer idea, idea than we usually do of what we mean by conscious and unconscious together with a large number of related terms. So I need to spend a little bit of time on definitions. Consciousness, unfortunately, is one of the more ambiguous words in our language. And as a result, a lot of the conflicts of opinion may be due more to terminological difficulties or vagueness than to substantive issues. It's necessary for me to distinguish at least uh, four senses of the term consciousness in order to address some issues in second language learning. Consciousness as a state, as awareness, as intention, and as knowledge. Consciousness as a state means no more than normal waking consciousness, which is a characteristic of any organism when it's up and running, and which entails also the registration, processing, and acting upon information. So we can contrast consciousness as a state with other states like dreaming, dream, dreamful and dreamless sleep, coma, uh, intoxicated states, and uh, states induced by meditation, etc. That's about the last I'll say about consciousness as a state. Uh, although there's been some interest in the language learning field in the effect of hypnosis and the relaxed state in, induced by Baroque music on language learning, I think that these concerns are not central to current theories. If someone should advocate sleep learning as the ideal way to learn a second language, we would have to consider the issues more carefully. If anybody's curious, there's no evidence that you can learn in your sleep. <laughs> I have some experiments if anyone wants to ask a question about that. In common usage and in theoretical treatments alike, the most common uh, meaning of consciousness is awareness. Consciousness is typically associated with awareness. But almost all writers on the subject have recognized that you must distinguish levels of awareness. Uh, there are many such schemes, 
and the number of levels that are identified and the distinctions that are made and the terms that are used vary a lot depending on whether the writer's intention is to try to understand subjective experience, uh, clinical syndromes, the processing of information or memory structure. For my purposes, I'm going to try to uh, point out the differences among four different levels of awareness. First is what I'm just calling simple responsiveness. <coughs> An organism can be said to be conscious of some aspect of its environment if its behavior simply co-varies with that aspect of the environment. Uh, simple responsiveness can be based on innate mechanisms or the simplest of learning and does not involve intermediary representations. Now, at this level, responsiveness is a characteristic of all nervous systems and probably includes plants. So I don't think that this is crucial for second language learning. Mm -hmm. Perception, however, can be contrasted with simple responsiveness in the sense that uh, sensations may involve individual neurons, whereas uh, perception entails changes in the patterns or sets of neurons, and also implies organization. That is to say, the ability to, to create internal mental representations and use those as a basis for behavior. So when we listen to language, uh, what we perceive is not the direct physical stimuli from the environment, but a highly interpreted version of that based on internal mental structure. Emotions also and images of all types are not simple responses to external stimuli, but uh, are based on internal mental structures. The level of noticing is something I will uh, stress in this particular talk. It's important to notice the distinction between perceiving something and noticing it. When we're reading, for example, we normally attend to the content of what we're reading rather than uh, the style of type in which the, the uh, text is set or music playing on a radio in the next room. But of course, we do not cease to perceive those things and we can turn our attention to them and notice them if we choose to. There are a lot of terms in use for what I'm calling noticing. Uh, some people call this level of, aware of awareness focal awareness as opposed to peripheral awareness. It's also called episodic awareness, and some writers prefer to, ta prefer to talk of, of uh, self-awareness. Uh, Wallace Chafe comments that this level of, of awareness represents the activation of information in the service of the self. This is an important distinction between noticing and perceiving, uh, especially since many behaviorists argue that stimuli must be perceived in order to affect behavior, but not consciously noticed. Also, noticing determines what you are able to give a verbal report of, um, so that some psychologists distinguish between better than chance performance on a forced choice test, which indicates perception, as opposed to verbal report, which indicates that what was perceived was also noticed. And that's one important sense in which we commonly say that we're aware of something consciously aware of something, but it does not exhaust the possibilities. Once we've noticed some aspect of our environment, we can think about it. We can analyze it, compare it to what we've noticed on other occasions, and attempt to understand its significance. All of this mental activity, what we normally think of as higher mental processes, goes on within consciousness. Problem solving belongs to this level of consciousness, as uh, do meta metalinguistic awareness and, in fact, metacognitions or awarenesses aware of awareness uh, of all types. Um, consciousness is attention, intention. The most common ambiguity in everyday use of the term consciousness is between awareness and intention. When we say that we, we've done something consciously using the adverbial form, we usually mean that we did it deliberately. Okay, Alan B. Alistock, for example, talks about conscious strategies such as practice and restricts this to deliberate attempts by a learner to increase exposure to the language outside of class, not counting uh, practice in class over which the learner has little control. Okay. Many writers have emphasized the importance of distinguishing between consciousness as awareness and consciousness as intention, although there is a connection between the two. We often become aware of what we intend to notice but they can also be dissociated. Intentions themselves are not always conscious. We're not normally conscious of what we are going to say until we say it, 
although we may plan it in advance. It's also possible to notice things that you did not intend to notice. The peculiarities of someone's speech may capture your attention. A pain in your foot may be impossible to avoid noticing, and so on. Now, in those cases, some writers talk about unconscious awareness. Uh, but I find that confusing and prefer terms like unintentional awareness or automatic attention, which is another term that's in use. Finally, consciousness is knowledge. Uh, a lot of people have pointed out that it's very common to say that you are conscious of something if you know it. Another common use of consciousness. Although there is an important distinction between being aware of something in the psychological present and knowing something consciously, meaning that you can dredge it out of memory, or perhaps in some cases, conscious knowledge means things that you can become aware of through introspection. Um, conscious knowledge is very difficult because consciousness is a, is a very ambiguous term, and so is knowledge. Knowledge is very troublesome in psychological terms, and therefore I find it it's a little disturbing that most of the talk about consciousness in second language learning has had to has been phrased in terms of conscious and unconscious knowledge. Um, it's a very tricky term. Chomsky, for example, discusses the distinction in terms of the following two sentences. John is too stubborn to talk to him. And John is too stubborn to talk to. Now, according to Chomsky, native speakers of English know consciously that John is the subject of talk in the first sentence, but not in the second. And him in the first sentence may not refer to John. But native speakers of English know unconsciously much more fundamental principles, including the non-parametrized principle that pronominals cannot see command their antecedents. Uh, this is a little tricky because that's, and, and Chomsky re calls this uh, cognized knowledge and relates it to terms like ex implicit knowledge, uh, term already in use. It's a little difficult, though, because the distinction between explicit and implicit knowledge being drawn here is not the same as the one that's typical in the second language field, where explicit knowledge uh, typically means that you're able to give an articulate report. Uh, and it's not true that all native speakers of English can say, yes, I understand that in, in the sentence, John is too stubborn to talk to him, that John is the subject of talk. Whereas in John is too stubborn to talk to, John is not the subject of talk. Okay? I've tried this on various linguistically naive native speakers. And you know, I, they understand that, but they can't say it. Okay? So um, I, I don't want to stick with explicit knowledge and implicit knowledge. These are alternative uh, terms for talking about conscious and unconscious knowledge. I think that. Uh, explicit and implicit, like conscious and unconscious, represent a continuum. And whatever point on the continuum you decide to, to identify as the boundary of consciousness will largely determine whether you say that knowledge is con mostly conscious or mostly unconscious. Another distinction between knowledge types that's uh, frequently made is between declarative knowledge, that is knowledge of facts, and procedural knowledge, that is knowledge of how to do things. Um, it's not clear what the relationship between those two terms and conscious and unconscious knowledge are. Consciousness then can refer to state, awareness, intention, or knowledge. It's a tricky term. And for many people, that means that other terms are preferable. But I'm going to stick with them because it's the topic of my talk. And I also, I think that the other terms are not really more precise. The distinction between controlled and automatic processing, for example, is appealing to many people um, and is, is quite clear. There's general agreement on when things may be called controlled or automatic. But um, Schneider, Dumay, and Schifrin in a 1984 article point out that there are at least a dozen characteristics that have been proposed to distinguish between automatic and controlled processing. And none of these provide us necessary and sufficient basis for distinguishing the two types of processes. Uh, in the middle of this, this mess, it might be nice if we could use the term subconscious to distinguish some of these meanings. Um, about all I'm going to say about that is that most people seem to be under the assumption that the term subconscious is a well-defined technical term in some theory which distinguishes between three uh, terms, conscious, subconscious, and unconscious. But that's not true. Uh, there aren't theories that I know of um, that have a nice 
three-way distinction like that. Most of the time when people say subconscious, they mean unconscious. They're comparing, they mean conscious and non-conscious. And I have not really been able to find somebody who uh, is talking about three levels of awareness. So I'm not going to use the term subconscious at all. If unconscious bothers you, you can just think non-conscious, and that will match with what I'm saying. Uh, it's a murky area then. I hope at least uh, this brief discussion has indicated that there might be a lot of ways in which we could take the question of whether second language learning is conscious or unconscious. And I've identified seven. Um, learning is sometimes said to be unconscious when the learner is not aware of learning something. Conscious learning, on the other hand, might involve not just awareness, but also awareness that you're aware of something. It's a very interesting distinction based on the, notice, on the notion of reflexive self-consciousness, uh, but it's not one on which there's any research. The conscious-unconscious learning contrast may refer to awareness at the level of noticing or focal attention. So in this case, conscious learning means learning based on what you notice in input rather than uh, unconscious learning, which would mean picking up stretches of speech without ever noticing them. Uh, th I think that's a, an important issue. I call it the subliminal learning question. Is it possible to learn language that is not attended to or noticed? And my answer is no. <clears throat> the contrast may also be made with reference to awareness at the level of understanding. So in this case, Unconscious learning means acquiring a set of principles or rules or algorithms without awareness of them. Whereas conscious learning means the establishment of such principles based on conscious understanding and insight. This is the issue of implicit learning. Conscious and unconscious learning are just as commonly distinguished on the basis of intention. So instead of, paying, instead of stressing whether the learner uh, notices something, you may, may stress whether the, learning, the learner intended to notice it, to pay attention. This is an incidental learning question, as opposed to intentional learning. And it's quite important to keep separate the issues of implicit learning, learning without awareness, and incidental learning, learning without int intention, because they are not at all isomorphic. Conscious learning can also refer to intentional learning at a more global level, involving studying, uh, and other intentional learning strategies, but such learning might still involve noticing and understanding. And finally, conscious learning can be referred to the issue of conscious knowledge. Can learners say what they appear to know? And I call this the articulate report question. Um, most of the second language uh, literature deals with the last of these questions, with, with second language learners' abilities, ability to state rules. Uh, but the remainder of my talk is going to be uh, concerned with the issues of subliminal, incidental, and implicit learning. I'm not going to say too much about, you know, about theories of consciousness because I will, uh, would spend a, a long time if I didn't keep rain on myself. Uh, but I think that the most important theories of consciousness for second language learning are those that attempt to account for the role of consciousness in cognition in general. Uh, there's no theory that's uncontroversial, but all of the ones I've looked at attempt to explain what I've called noticing and the systems that give rise to it. In information processing theories, for example, uh, the basic postulate of information processing theories is that humans are limited capacity information processors. And the notion of consciousness in most uh, theories of this type is associated in one way or another with this notion of a limited capacity system. Uh, but there are three main variants on it. Consciousness is identified with the contents of a limited capacity memory system, short-term memory, with a limited capacity information selection system, that is attention, or with a limited capacity control system that acts as a central executive. Figure one in your handout has to do with uh, a multi-store model of memory. Consciousness is short-term memory. Most multi-store mod models of memory specify three stores. Here I indicate sensory registers, short-term store, and long-term store. Short-term memory, by the way, means what you're aware of now, okay? and including what happened a few seconds ago. It doesn't mean what you can remember tomorrow. <clears throat> 
that, or even five minutes from now. That's, that's long-term memory already. Okay, so uh, I only have two points to make here. One is that in most such models, um, focal awareness, short-term memory, and consciousness are essentially equivalent. The other point I'd like, to, I'd like to bring out is the claim in these models that nothing gets into long-term memory without going through short-term memory. Nothing gets into long-term memory without going through consciousness. Nothing gets into long-term memory without being noticed. So if we make that identification between short-term store and consciousness, and if nothing gets into long-term memory without going through short-term memory, then it means you can't learn without consciousness. Maybe. We'll look at some evidence. Uh, other information processing models relate consciousness to uh, attention. That is the control process here that uh, affects the transfer of information into focal awareness. Attention is often viewed as a switchboard or a gate or as a filter that prevents uh, us from being overwhelmed by the complexity of information presented to us from, by the world. Um, Attention is often viewed as a resource, which is in limited supply. Other theories describe it as, identify it with effort or with psychic energy. And other metaphors talk about, uh, use a spatial analogy and talk about the span of attention, which is uh, a lot closer to the idea of, of uh, short-term memory or working memory. Uh, now, it's the, conscious, it's the concept of attention as a limited resource that leads to the distinction between two kinds of information processing, commonly called controlled and automatic information processing, um, defined in terms of the, often in terms of the, the degree to which two tasks can be performed concurrently. Okay? Certainly, there are things that you can do at the same time. So an example of effective time sharing might be driving your car while you have a conversation with somebody in your native language. Other things cannot be done well at the same time. For example, uh, driving your car or someone else's car um, backwards on a bumpy road by the edge of a cliff and trying to carry on a conversation in a language that you barely know. <laughs> so we have a distinction then between uh, controlled processes which require attention and awareness and automatic processes which, which don't. Um, there are a lot of issues, but I want to focus on the same two really quickly. First of all, the extent to which controlled processing is identified with conscious processing. Uh, and second, whether attention and controlled processing are considered to be necessary for learning. For the first question, there is some debate. There are many theories of controlled and automatic information processing. And most of them say controlled processing is conscious processing. However, the most influential model of controlled and automatic processing, that of Schiffen and Schneider, is quite equivocal on this point. Okay, so Schiffen and Schneider say uh, that the phenomenological feeling of consciousness lies in a subset of short-term store, especially that part which is attended to and uh, given controlled processing, but they also identify what they call veiled controlled processes, uh, which are not easy to perceive because they may take place very quickly. Okay, as for the relationship between attention and learning, uh, William James said in 1890 that an object once attended to will remain in the memory, whereas one inattentively, inattentively allowed to pass will lead, leave no traces. And my experience is what I agree to attend to. Only those items I notice shape my mind. Um, that's for attention. Controlled processing is also identified with learning not only because the transition from control to automatic processing is itself a kind of learning, but also because experimental work has indicated that storage in long-term memory seems to require control processing. So uh, because of the close relationship between consciousness and both attention and control processing, <laughs> each of which is considered prerequisite for learning, we have some additional theoretical grounds for suggesting that consciousness is required for learning. But because this relationship among terms is not one of identity, uh, it's possible that, for example, that learning might require attention without necessarily requiring awareness. Um, finally, some information processes see 
processing theories see consciousness as an internal programmer or a kind of a central executive, a kind of an executive control center um, that's in charge of uh, planning, decision making, and troubleshooting. Okay. This is mostly relevant for output, and I'm not going to be saying much about output, so I'll, I'll skip. Okay. Um, I'd like to look just very quickly then at a theory that's influenced more by some work in artificial intelligence. In general, information processing and other cognitive approaches stress the importance of awareness in learning, but those that emphasize automatic processing do indicate that a lot of mental life goes on without the benefit of consciousness. That point of view has been carried much further in the field of artificial intelligence, where there is a, a view of mind has been proposed that distinguishes between a central processor, which consciously perceives, plans, and occasionally decides, and a large number of specialized, independent, um, unconscious processors that take care of most of, most of mental life. Um, <clears throat> this perspective has been elaborated into a theory of consciousness by Bernard Bars, and my table two, figure two, gives you a picture of what he proposes. The, um, the basic idea here is uh, one of distributed information processing, in which control is distributed among a large number of specialized processors, each of which is data-driven. So it responds whenever a, a relevant stimulus configuration is uh, presented. There's no central executive in charge. Uh, but these systems need a, of, need a means of communicating with each other. <coughs> so Bars pr pr proposes that the best analogy for consciousness is not a powerful executive, but a broadcasting station that accepts information from all different sources and broadcasts it um, in a coherent form to a large number of viewers who will have their own uses for information. Bars also suggests that something uh, like this, where um, he suggests that conscious experience results when interaction between an energy pattern and contextual constraints results in a coherent representation. He also proposes that a global database acting in uh, coordination with a large number of specialized processors is an ideal learning device because in addition to specialized solutions to standard problems, the entire configuration can be used to develop new processors uh, that are added in a mo modular fashion. This model is, is, uh, is quite different. It, um, it's similar to some other theories, though. There's a neural theory of mind that's been proposed by O'Keefe, who identifies consciousness with the operation of the septo-hippocampal system, which acts as an interface between different sets of neural structures. Uh, there are also some similarities between Barr's model of consciousness and uh, Fodor's uh, uh, description of uh, modular cognitive systems, which he calls input systems. One of the main differences there is that Fodor's input systems are restricted to innate systems whereas uh, this model is intended to account for both innate and learned systems. In sum, for this section, I think you can see that different theories of consciousness have uh, different approaches, have taken very different directions and have associated consciousness with such varied conscious uh, constructs as working memory, attention, controlled processing, and information exchange between otherwise autonomous processors. But at the same time, all of these theories are talking about roughly the same thing. They all identify consciousness in one way or another with online phenomenological awareness, what I'm aware of now. And all of them are compatible with the view that consciousness separates mental life into two fairly distinct spheres. If I can try to give a definition now. Consciousness is the experiential manifestation of the operation of a limited capacity central processor. Conscious processing is serial, 
slow, inefficient, and effortful, but it displays range and flexibility and is partially subject to deliberate control. It can be used for setting goals and for troubleshooting. Unconscious processes are attributed to specialized systems which operate in parallel. They're not under subject control, but they're also not limited by short-term memory capacity. They have the advantages of speed, efficiency, and accuracy, accuracy, and they're responsible for skilled behavior. And finally, all theories of consciousness in one way or another insist upon some role of consciousness in dealing with novel information and novice behavior, and therefore learning. Now I can look at second language learning. Uh, there are many issues that one could talk about, and I'm only going to discuss three. Uh, the first one, the role of consciousness in the process through which input becomes intake that figures in language making. Second, the degree to which the learner, the language learner, controls the process of intake. And three, the role of conscious understanding in hypothesis formation. The concept of intake is crucial for second language learning, but there is at present no consensus on the definition of intake, the difference between input and intake, the principles that determine what's available for intake, what is actual intake, and the role of the learner. Stephen Krashen apparently considers intake to be synonymous with comprehensible input, uh, that subset of linguistic input that helps the acquirer acquire language, that is to say, an external variable. Uh, Lydia White has taken a very different point of view, suggesting that learner, the learner's internal grammar defines what becomes input, intake, sorry, and that, quote, learners are able unconsciously to focus on input relevant to I plus one. That's closer to Corder's original definition. Input is what goes in, not what is available for going in, and we may reasonably suppose that it is the learner who controls this input, or more properly, his intake. This may well be determined by the characteristics of his language acquisition mechanism. I don't think that definition is satisfactory, totally satisfactory either, since Corder manages to contradict himself within two sentences, saying first that the learner controls intake, and then that the learner does not, the language acquisition device does. Um, I think, first of all, uh, input is external, intake is internal. Uh, we need to distinguish between what Chodron calls preliminary intake and final intake. That is what Slobin recommends, distinguishing between the processes involved in converting speech input into stored data. That's preliminary intake. And uh, those used to organize stored data into, into linguistic systems. That is final intake. Um, also, many uh, people, including Sharwood Smith, uh, Ferk and Casper and Van Patten have pointed out that it's unlikely that all input that functions in comprehension also fun functions in intake. Comprehension does not require the processing of all linguistic forms, and it's well known that even when linguistic forms are uh, processed, they're rapidly purged from short-term memory with only semantic and pragmatic information uh, remaining. Considering those factors, I propose the following hypothesis. Intake is that part of the input that the learner notices. Uh, now, at this point in the argument, it makes no difference whether you intend to notice it or not. Okay, so I'm not talking. I'm talking about not talking yet about uh, incidental or intentional learning. If you notice it, it's intake. If you don't notice it, it's not intake. Uh, the primary source of data I have in support of this hypothesis uh, comes from a study I published a few years ago with Sylvia Frota on my own acquisition of Portuguese. Uh, I spent five months in Brazil in 1983. I had no previous uh, instruction or exposure to the language. Um, shortly after arrival, I took a five-week course. And for the remainder of my time, I uh, depended on learning through interaction with native speakers. I kept a journal recording all kinds of things that I noticed about my language learning what was going on, what strategies I had. And I arranged to have myself tape recorded at regular intervals and turned those tapes over to a Brazilian linguist. I said, here, you analyze them, see what's going on. Then we'll look at what I have in my journal and see if there's any connection between the two. And what I found was really a remarkable correspondence 
between my reports of what I'd noticed when Brazilians talked to me and what I said myself. For example, we looked at 14 uh, verbal constructions that I was taught in class. And we found, first of all, that the fact that a particular verb form was taught didn't mean that I would ever produce it. Uh, nor did the order in which they were taught determine whether or in what order I would produce it. <laughs> we then looked at uh, some input data. We didn't have much, only my interlocutor talking with me on the same tapes. And we found, uh, we looked at the frequency of those verb forms and in input, and we found a better match. Uh, forms that never appeared in the input in the sample we have uh, didn't appear in my speech either. Mm -hmm. However, there were forms in the input also that I didn't produce. And a uh, search of the diary notes indicated that the best explanation is that the forms I used were the ones that I noticed people using for me, to me. They were written down in my diary. Uh, I would report that on a particular day, someone said something to me. There's the form. I had noticed it long enough, remembered it long enough to write it down, and those were the forms uh, that I produced. I'll just give you one brief example. Um, this isn't something I was taught, actually. As we also looked at forms that I was not taught, but would have been taught if I stayed in another class. Um, but I decided to stay out all night and learn language instead of getting up early in the morning to learn language. Uh, we only found one form that I was not taught that I acquired, and that was the use of the verb ter, have, to make existential sentences in Portuguese. Um, I wasn't taught that. I did have a formulaic expression, não tem problema, no problem. Okay. Uh, but I just thought of it as no problem. Uh, on the very first tape recording, I tried to say things like, uh, uh, there was this, there was that, and I didn't know how to do it. And I tried using the copulars, ser and a star, and fooling around with them, trying to think, did they go in the perfect or the imperfect? How do you say there was? You know, I'd say era, foi, estava. All of those are wrong. Um, OK. A few weeks later, I wrote in my diary, um, now tem problema is so-and-so's favorite expression, and I hear it all the time. Tonight he said, tem aqui cartas de jogar, which might mean, do you have any playing cards here? But I think it might also mean, are there any playing cards here? A few days later, I noted in my diary that I had been listening and noticing, and yes, ha, that verb have is being used to make existential sentences. And from that point on, I produced them on tape all the time. Okay? There are many cases like that. Uh, there are lots in case of cases where something shows up on a tape for the first time, and I can identify from the diary when I noticed it, even though it had been there all along. For example, in, I was told in class that in Portuguese, there are long and short forms of question words. So uh, I was told, uh, if you want to say what, you can say uke or uke ike. But I never heard that long form. I never, and I thought it was just another one of those things they tell you in class that aren't right. Okay. Week 21, that was the week before I was to leave Brazil, I wrote in my diary that suddenly I had heard this. I was swimming, and a friend said something to me I didn't catch right away, but I thought it sounded like qu'est-ce que c'est, French, <laughs> but shorter, like qu'est-ce que c'est. And I thought, que que c'est, that must be o que e que você. Okay, it was a contracted form, and I noticed it week 21 for the first time. However, if I check, and I, and I used it right after that. Okay. Quickly, I used it. Okay, uh, but later I went back and I looked, and I found that on the very first tape, my interlocutor used those forms to me 43% of the time. <laughs> so they were there all along, and they were part of my input all along, but I never noticed them. Okay. As soon as I noticed them, I started using them. Uh, there are lots of examples like that, but I want to move on to some of these other questions, too. Um, I think this study provides a pretty strong evidence um, for a close connection between noticing and emergence in uh, production. But it doesn't show that noticing is sufficient or necessary. Uh, it doesn't show that it's sufficient because there are cases where I noticed things, remembered them, and then forgot for a little while, and then forgot them. Okay. There are cases, for example, where I noticed a, 
it's possible to tell from the transcripts that I noticed a form because I repeated the form in a, a form would show up in a question and I would repeat it in my answer, suggesting that I noticed it briefly, long enough to repeat it. And uh, in one case, the same evening, uh, I, I wrote in my diary, I wonder why I ne never heard this form. You know, I heard it that day on tape. I mean, I had heard it and repeated it on tape. Um, also, you know, my st the study doesn't demonstrate that noticing is necessary. There's one case, of all of the verb forms we looked at, 21 of them, there's one form that I produced sometimes, the conditional, and I don't have any record of that in my diary. I can't, I'm sure I noticed. I'm sure I heard it and I noticed it, but I never wrote it down. There'd be no reason why I would, because I didn't have a plan to write down every verb form I ever heard. Okay? And so it's just by coincidence that I got them all, except for one. Now, I, I don't think there are any other studies like this, but even if there were, they wouldn't settle this problem eventually, because uh, completely because of the memory problem. Um, failure to report that something has been noticed will never really show conclusively that the event was not registered into conscious awareness at the time. So the best evidence for the claim that noticing is a necessary condition for storage comes from studies in which the focus of attention is experimentally controlled. Okay, the basic finding comes from experiments done at the very beginning of research in the information processing paradigm uh, in experiments that investigate the cocktail party phenomenon using dichotic listening, uh, where you are presented to with information in both ears and you attend to one channel and ignore the other one. Or in shadowing, where you repeat what is being presented to one channel right at, as close to simultaneously as you can. In those studies, when you are directing your attention to one channel, the information in the other channel is lost. Mm -hmm. Unless the shadowing is stopped at some point, and then you have pretty good recall for a target item that was presented just a few seconds before. Okay. So you know, this indicates that the information in the unattended channel makes it into, makes it into, into short-term store just makes it in, but it's not attended to, not given conscious processing, and doesn't seem to make it into long-term store. Uh, now, these experiments are in support of the model that says if it doesn't get into short-term memory, it doesn't get into long-term memory. Uh, a lot of people think that everything that impinges upon your sentence senses gets into your brain and gets stored permanently. Yeah? But this really seems to be uh, folk psychology. Okay. That's not to say there's no such thing as subliminal, subliminal perception or subliminal processing. Uh, there is. Uh, there are well-known studies. Forgive me if I don't cite everything, but I've got a long bibliography for anyone who wants to look at it. Uh, there are classic studies showing that if you uh, present shock-associated words in the unattended channel, you can get galvanic skin response. Okay. Or if you're attending to a channel and hear the sentence, uh, they threw stones towards the bank. And in the unattended channel, there's the word river. Then when asked later whether you thought of a bank where you get money or a river bank, you're more likely to say river bank. Right? Uh, there are experiments showing that you can present two words in the unattended channel. Uh, neither one will be recalled, but there'll be some effect on behavior. So if you're attending in your left ear and the right ear, right ear you hear uh, fair taxi. I ask you, what did you hear? Nothing. You have no recall. But if I give you a spelling test later and slip in the word fair, you're more likely to spell it F-A-R-E, which is the less common meaning than if it, taxi had not been presented with it in the subliminal channel. Okay. So experimental perception, you know, it's, it has been very controversial over the, year, over the years, but it seems to me it's generally accepted. But these experiments don't really provide support for the idea that you could learn language that way. First of all, their effects on processing are typically small. They make themselves known indirectly by affecting other processes. And most importantly, in all cases that I've been able to track down, they involve stimuli that are very well known already to the subjects. They involve native language words, shock-associated words, letters of the alphabets. Okay, that is to say, they represent the activation of memories, not the creation of new ones, uh, which is why I'm claiming you can't learn a second language or anything else subliminally. I'm sure there'll be time for questions. <laughs>
Uh, let me look at my second question. If you have to notice in order to uh, learn for something to become intake, do you have to pay attention? Do you have to intend to attend? Uh, well, the studies in selective listening, including the, the a dichotic listening studies show that people do have some control over what they pay attention to and can direct their attention to one source of an information and ignore another. And we have some similar studies in second language learning field. Holstein and Holstein have shown uh, that it's possible to do that. In a study dealing with the accuracy of two Dutch word order rules, they instructed sub some subjects to pay attention to grammatical form and others to content. The subjects were able to do that. Uh, those who, under the attention to form condition, showed more grammatical accuracy, while the retellings under the attention to information condition produced higher information scores. Uh, that study actually deals with attention to output. Uh, because the grammatical constructions that were scored were triggered by frames that required a different syntactic structure from the one in the input. Um, however, a more recent study by Bill Van Patten uh, deals with attention to form versus content and in input. He had uh, assigned classes of learners of Spanish as a foreign language to four different groups. Uh, one group paid attention to information content only. Two groups paid attention, were told to pay attention simultaneously to information and uh, two grammatically uninformative uh, morphemes. And the fourth group paid attention to information and a lexically important word. Now, he didn't score, I don't think. Uh, I don't think he included a measure to indicate whether attention to form produced better accuracy, but he did find uh, that when subjects were instructed to listen to content and grammatical form, uh, they didn't do so well in, re in recalling the content. So studies like this indicate that what notices is partially subject to voluntary control, but certainly not completely. Uh, Chomsky's rejection of any role for conscious attention in first language acquisition, though not for foreign language acquisition, as I noticed, as I noted, is uh, really rests on, on uh, two things. First of all, the determinate nature of language acquisition, and second, the assumption that learning is uniform and complete for all individuals. Now, the assumption of completeness is not tenable for second language learning, but Several people have told me that they think that the determinacy argument, that is to say the existence of natural orders and developmental sequences, is, uh, undermines any role for attention in second language learning. And it's, this argument is frequently evoked in the, invoked in the can learning become acquisition controversy. Uh, just briefly, I'd like to say that I don't really think that that argument uh, affects uh, my claim that attention is required. Um, uh, that noticing is acquired because, first of all, the intent to attend, okay, paying attention is only one of the factors that is going to determine whether items and in input are noticed. And it's important to know whether the principles that explain orders and sequences are completely different from those that determine noticing or whether they're part of the same story. Okay? And there's, I think there's some evidence to suggest that natural orders and developmental sequences may be partly determined by the same things that determine uh, noticing. Um, I'm referring to Peenum and Johnson's work, for, Johnston's work, for example. They propose that developmental features can be explained by output speech processing demands, uh, frequency, um, which, if all else is equal, uh, to have an, uh, increases the likelihood of an item being noticed, has also been claimed to predict acquisition uh, orders of English morphemes and L2 development. Uh, perceptual salience is cited as a basic determinant of L1 acquisition by Slobin, and obviously has a lot to do with what you're able to notice. And there's still more to the story. Task demands. Uh, I mention because they're a powerful determinant of what's noticed. Um, Erickson and Simon report that an extensive literature on tasks supports the conclusion that the information committed to memory is essentially the information that must be heeded in order to carry out a task. Okay. Uh, expectations affect uh, 
learning and are generally recognized as uh, determinants of perceptibility and noticeability. Um, also, many writers have noticed that unexpected events tend to capture our attention and become unconscious. I also list skill level here, including both proficiency level and perhaps automaticity of information processing. So I think that the, the, the process of noticing is probably dependent on all of these factors. I want to just make one remark about children. I really mean most of what I say to be applicable to second language learning by adults. And this is really my only comment on, on children. Uh, McLaughlin, Rossman, and McLeod have proposed that if any theory of the role of consciousness in language learning must account for the fact that children learn the rules of grammar incidentally as a byproduct of trying to communicate with others. And they relate this uh, to a distinction between focal as opposed to peripheral attention to the formal properties of language. Now, it occurs to me there are three ways to take that. It could be claimed that children acquire the formal properties of language without noticing them. That's to say, in contradiction to what I've said, which is you can't learn anything if you don't notice it. Or it could be a claim that children learn without intending to learn. But that's true of everybody. Okay? If task demands, require that you attend to certain information, you'll learn it whether you, whether you particularly want to or not. Or it could mean, a third possibility, that children learn language form because they notice it without intending to notice it even when it's not required for the task. Okay. Okay. Even when the task does not require it and they're not attending to it, they learn it, but can't help it. Okay. There's some experimental evidence for that. Uh, I can see I'm not going to have get through half my experimental evidence tonight, but it has to do with showing cards, uh, children, uh, showing children cards, and on one card there might be a, a picture of a rabbit and uh, a household object. So each card has a picture of an animal and a household object. The children have to re learn where the animals are, where they're located in columns and rows, and then later you unexpectedly test them and see if they can remember what was on the same card with a rabbit. Hmm. It's very interesting. Uh, the ability to remember where the animals are, that's, that's what you're supposed to do, goes up with age. But children tend to also to remember what was on the card with the rabbit. Okay, so that's a kind of incidental learning. And that declines with age especially after age 13. I, I find that really interesting because the period of decline kind of matches up with the sensitive period for, for language acquisition. What some people have suggested is that, so th this would be a case, what this is arguing is that it's not that children acquire things without noticing them, okay, but that, that children have kind of an open, open awareness of the world. And what we get later on in life is a more strategic approach where we can direct our attention uh, more specifically to things. If that's true, there are two possibilities. One is you can say, adults can learn languages if they just act like kids and have this open awareness. But this kind of cognitive change might not be reversible because strategic behavior is very useful in life in general. Okay? So uh, what I'm suggesting here is that uh, it might be a mistake with adults to, to emphasize exclusive attention to meaning because adults can do that and maybe children can't. Uh, okay, I want to look at the next big question, understanding. Uh, suppose you've noticed something in a language. Do you have to figure it out? Do you have to understand its significance? A lot of people in the second language uh, field say no. Uh, it seems obviously, uh, obvious that, that, no, you don't have to understand language in order to acquire it. Uh, part of the reason for this is that we use the metaphor of the learner as linguist. Even though we recognize it as a metaphor, we've grown very used to talk about language learners that talk as if they were sophisticated grammarians. So we talk about learners, L1 and L2 learners, as starting with a set of, of assumptions, very abstract assumptions about language being on the lookout for certain uh, crucial data, and adding, deleting, or uh, reorganizing rules, all part of an attempt to construct a theory of the language that we're learning. 
Uh, well, uh, I see a little problem there because although these thought processes are of the type that typically go on in the highest forms of conscious reasoning, language learners, and especially children, don't seem to be engaged in such a rational exercise as constructing a theory of a language. Now, the typical solution to all of that has been to say that, well, it's, it's going on unconsciously. And unconscious thought is pretty much like conscious thought, except that it's written in a special code and you can't read it, you can't intuit it, you can't introspect it. Maybe. Okay. I just want to call your attention to the fact that there's a very different point of view floating around, expressed by some cognitive psychologists, who uh, say you can't learn anything without understanding it, without awareness. Um, I'll give you a quote here from William Brewer, um, who said, did what is probably the most thorough review of the conditioning literature and came to the conclusion that all the results of the traditional con conditioning literature are due to the operation of higher mental processes. There is not and never has been any convincing evidence for unconscious automatic mechanisms in the conditioning of adult human beings. Now, of course, there are many, many claims that people can be conditioned without their awareness. What Brewer said is that most of the time, nobody ever bothered to find out what they were aware of. But from among thousands of experiments in the behaviorist literature, he pulled out a couple of hundred that allowed uh, you to look at uh, whether or not uh, learners were aware of what was going on. He identified 11 different experimental paradigms, and his review uh, says that it's pretty clear. If you're in an experiment, if you are a subject in an experiment, and if the experimenter is trying to condition you to blink your eyes every time he says an abstract noun, if you can figure out that he wants you to blink your eyes when he says an abstract noun, and if you feel cooperative, you will. Uh, he says, this, this review claims that um, aware subjects condition and unaware subjects do not. Uh, for some types of conditioning, for classical conditioning, uh, there is a 1987 review that updates uh, things and comes to the same conclusion. And a couple of hundred more studies have been uh, reviewed by Erickson and Simon in 1984 and come to the same conclusion. Uh, what these reviewers say is that the studies that report learning without awareness are all uh, very faulty in one of two ways. They either don't have control subjects or they do not assess awareness sensitively. So that, for example, uh, if you want to show that learning is unconscious, you put somebody through a conditioning experiment and later on you say to them, uh, what do you think the experiment was about? And you have the right answer written down and they have to match that, otherwise you say they were unaware. Okay. That's kind of common, actually. Uh, or you assess awareness only at the very end of a long series of learning trials. Such studies commonly report learning without awareness, whereas studies that probe awareness after each learning trial report that once people figure it out, they learn. Uh, also, subjects uh, get un incorrectly classified as uh, being unaware when they're not able to formulate the concept as it's defined by the experimenter. And there are two problems there. One is that subjects may lack the meta language required to express their awareness. Another set of problems arises when it's not clear that the experimenter's con concept is actually required to define what's been learned. Um, experimenters usually think they know what's needed to solve uh, a problem or learn a particular task, but sometimes it turns out that completely different strategies would have solved the problem. And in those cases, if you ask people what was going on, you may uh, falsely classify them as unaware. Um, I'm going to skip over that literature and just say what I have to say about understanding. Uh, there's not much in our literature that allows us to address the question of whether or not understanding is necessary for acquisition. Um, for some of the paradigms that are used in psychology, there's no equivalent. Um, for example, in psychology, you can, you can give a, uh, set up a condition where you tell people false rules and then attempt to condition them. But that would be an immoral experiment for us to do. Uh, in psychology, there is something called the informed pairing design, where you simply tell people what the 
contingency is and see if they condition. Of course, that's like instruction in our field. But as we know, the results of the of studies looking at the role of instruction are a little bit unclear. Okay. Also, in uh, psychology paradigms, you can just tell people, well, I'm not going to condition this anymore. I'm not, gonna re I'm not going to shock you anymore uh, when uh, you're presented with a particular word. Now, in those kinds of experiments, what happens is that people decondition, uncondition, if you disconnect the electrodes, not otherwise. They have to believe you. Okay. Well, we have something like that in the form of error correction, instructed extinction. But it doesn't work very well. Or actually, we have very few studies that investigate whether it works well at, at all or not. Uh, that show something conclusive. OK, I think there, there are two designs that have been used. Uh, the first one is what's called awareness of contingency. That is to say, you compare subjects who figured it out with subjects who have, subjects who have not figured it out, and you look at their uh, performance. Um, so I have a few studies. Herb Seliger in 79, or reported in 79, that he tested three subject groups, monolingual children, bilingual children, and adult ESL students, for their use of the A and allomorphs of the indefinite article. They had to look at uh, pictures of common objects like apple, car, chair. Um, and they were prodded to say a chair, an apple. And afterwards, they were asked if they had ever noticed a distinction, if they had ever noticed that sometimes they say a and sometimes they say an. And if they said yes, they were supposed to say why, what the rule is. And Seliger reported no relationship between knowing the rule and being able to perform. Okay. So we have one study comparing aware and unaware subjects, showing that it makes no difference. Um, well, let me just comment on that so I don't have to come back to it. Uh, the subjects in the Seliger study frequently came out with rather absurd rules. Um, and that study shows that they did not use the rules that they said they were using when pressed for an explanation. On the other hand, it doesn't show that they had any rule at all. Okay, the study doesn't show that they had implicit rules that they couldn't express. Uh, for one thing, the an allomorph shows up pretty late in acquisitions. Adults don't use it consistently, if you, start, if you listen for that. Also, all of the objects were common, very common. Um, so I, I find it kind of unlikely that a child who said an apple had never heard an apple. And it's entirely possible that the ones that said an apple are the ones that had noticed that they heard an apple. Okay. So I think there's a problem there in, in, in the sense that there's no evidence that there is an unconscious rule. There's evidence that the rules that they said they used, they didn't use, but not the other way. OK, Hulstein and Hulstein in their study with Dutch rule, uh, word order rules also looked at awareness. They asked uh, subjects if they knew what the rules were for these uh, verb placement rules. And they probed. They, used, they were fairly sensitive about it. They kept persisting and asking until they were quite convinced that the uh, subjects had said everything that was on their mind. And they found, in all four conditions, those who knew the rules did better. One other study by Tom Grigg uh, here at the University of Hawaii finds no relationship between a number of English constructions and knowledge of the rules. But that study used an insensitive measure of awareness, requiring learners to state the pedagogical rule as found in a textbook. Okay. Uh, there's another kind of design that's awareness of contingency design, in which you don't look at those who figured out your rule and not figured out your rule. You try to, you try to understand what they think the rule is and see if it matches their behavior. For this one, we have anecdotal evidence, uh, just a bit. Malcolm Johnston, in a recent paper, reports that uh, looking at the uh, interlanguage of some uh, immigrants and migrant workers in Australia, it seemed to him that they were using progressive ing as a general past tense marker. When he asked them what they thought, they said they thought it was a past tense marker. Sorace, in an article in Applied Linguistics, uh, dealing with the development of linguistic knowledge, of metalinguistic knowledge, reported that when learners gave anomalous or idiosyncratic rules, when she checked, these often turned out to be reflected in her performance. In other words, they were part of their, of their interlanguage grammar. Uh, 
Um, and that's about all I find in the, in the literature that looks at things that way, other than my study. Because um, the time's over, over, I'm going to tell you real quickly and not go through all these examples unless you ask me about them. In general, I found that when I understood something, I did it. When I couldn't figure it out, I didn't do it. If I figured it out incorrectly, I did it incorrectly. And some of these examples are here to demonstrate the very close relationship between what I figured out, correct or incorrect, and what I did in performance. I've got a mysterious case. Uh, it has to do with the acquisition of Portuguese aspect. And this, I'll just give you a brief outline of this, because it shows that you can attribute unconscious learning to someone uh, because you don't look carefully enough at what they did know. And you over-attribute unconscious knowledge to them. Okay? Basically, the situation is this. Aspect in Portuguese has been called wildly, in, in, uh, wildly inconsistent and complicated. What I thought I did was, well, I really had no idea. I had some minor rules of thumb. They explained very little in the data. Essentially, I had no principle for using a particular verb in either the perfect or the imperfect aspect. Yet, I did very well in performance. When the imperfect was called for, I got it right on the last tape 92% of the time. When the imperfect was called for, I got it right 74% of the time, 86% averaging them together. Very common conclusion that most of us would be willing to make, I think, considerable unconscious knowledge of a complicated rule system. Unconscious because I'm unable to state a principle. I cannot account for this. However, when we looked at the data, uh, well, we found an answer and then some more questions. The answer we found was it was lexical. If I used a particular verb, I never had to decide which aspect to use it in. I always used it in the same aspect, with, a few, with five exceptions, and they're all pseudo-variants. Pseudo yeah? Formulaic speech, or somebody asked me a question, I repeat, saying the same verb. Okay? Essentially lexical. Okay? Amazingly, that turns out to be pretty good. You get good performance that way. That suggests that maybe native speakers do that, too. So we looked at something else. We looked at frequency and input. We found it provided a good explanation. Uh, but we also looked at underlying semantics of particular verbs. And the best fit uh, is based on a match between whether a particular verb is inherently a durative or punctual and uh, imperfect and perfect aspect. Okay. Um, but at the same time, I cannot rule out the possibility that particular things that I noticed in the input actually explain this distribution. And there are cases, the distribution of the two copulas among the two aspects where that is accountable for in terms of what I could notice or not. Okay. So I come down to a case that looks at first as though it's really unconscious, no principle and good performance. Then it turns out that, well, I wasn't aware of any principle for varying verbs between the two aspects because I didn't. I didn't have any principle. Then we have to figure out why a particular verb would end up in a particular aspect, and I don't really think it can be answered. And Roger Anderson has claimed the same thing for uh, this exactly the same phenomenon uh, for two, two kids learning Spanish. So I'm not sure whether, that's a conscious, whether there's something going on there unconscious or not. The last example here, uh, this is on page five of your handout number three. This is something that was, I think, truly unconscious in a different sense. In Portuguese, there are lots of nouns, pairs of nouns, where one is masculine and it ends in O, U, and the other is feminine and ends in A. You have amigo, amiga, aluno, aluna, professor, professora. The word for husband is marido. There's no word marida. I made it up. I was told, don't say marida, that's not husband, that's not wife, say esposa. I never heard anybody say esposa, frankly. Uh, never. Actually, because uh, except when they were correcting me, I never heard it. It took me till the end of my stay to figure out they don't say esposa, only the textbooks say esposa. They say mulher. They don't say husband and wife, they say husband and woman. 
but that's not what they instruct you. Okay, the interesting thing about this is when I was told that I had produced a classic overgeneralization on tape, you know, this, was, this was the first tape, this is early, I was shocked. I didn't believe it. I did not believe it. I said, no, I didn't. I didn't make that up. That's the word. <laughs> and I believed that. I really did not believe, I mean, I have to believe native speakers. Native speakers are the experts. But it was quite inconceivable to me uh, that I had made this word up. I was sure that I heard it. Finally, people convinced me that if I had heard it, I had heard it that way. I had heard it from myself, no one else. <laughs> Well, that, that's true. I, your output is part of your input. So, um, but even after I was convinced that I had never heard, that, that I had made this up and not heard other people say it, I couldn't shake that feeling. It's familiar. It's just I know I hear that. Maybe it's Arabic. Uh, Arabic is a language that I used to know pretty well, and uh, it interfered with my Portuguese a lot in the beginning. But after a few weeks, I was able to suppress it and so that it wouldn't come out every time I opened my mouth. And I did a good job of it because after a while I couldn't think of, a, the, of an Arabic word no matter how tried, hard I tried. <laughs> so it wasn't until I got back to Honolulu that I realized that Marita is an Arabic word. Um, it's feminine singular adjective meaning sick. So I thought, oh, I'll call Dr. Freud. <laughs> uh, actually, I said ex Marita. Okay. Um, well, I, I think that that's uh, unconscious. But what I mean by unconscious in that case is not learning without awareness, because I, know the, I knew the principle perfectly well. If I had guessed, that's what I would guess. If someone said, the, the, the masculine is marido, what is the feminine? I would say, sure, I know the rule. But I didn't in that case. I'm quite sure I didn't, because I think I was caught right away, pretty much. Quickly. I ha certainly have no recollection of having gone through a conscious process of figuring it out. There's a similarity between that and what I think is maybe the best example I've found so far of what I think is implicit learning in, in, uh, in language. And that is the case of French gender. There is a nice study by uh, Tucker, Lambert, and Rigo. Um, 1977, and they report that native speakers of French are completely unable to describe the basis for assigning gender to nouns. When they're asked the gender of a noun, they tell you the gender of the noun. When you say why, how do you predict that, they don't know. If you press them, they make up implausible reasons. It sounds harsh, but a little semantic differential test on what they rate as harsh, and that's not it. They seem to have no idea that gender is predictable. Well, gender in French is variable. By the way, there must be a lot of people here who speak French. Do you know gender is predictable? By the phonological ending of the noun. But variably so. So there, there are some endings, such as action, which are invariably feminine, and others, such as wa, almost evenly distributed between masculine and feminine endings, uh, gender. Now, what Tucker, Lambert, and Rigol found was that when the ending reliably predicts the gender, native speakers all agree and all assign that gender to a novel noun or a nonsense noun ending in that, with that phonological shape. But where uh, the phonological shape only probabilistically determines gender, then when you ask your people a novel noun ending in that phonological shape, some will say masculine, some will say feminine. In fact, what they found was a remarkable agreement between the gender choices for novel nouns ending in particular phonological segments or endings and the frequency with which uh, nouns ending that way in the petite la russe have that gender. Okay? So if Nouns ending in a certain, uh, with a certain phonological shape, if in the dictionary 93% of them uh, are feminine, then when you ask, give people a novel noun that ends that way and you ask them what gender it is, about 93% will say feminine. Yeah? It's kind of an amazing case where the distribution of intuitions 
reflects pretty roughly. They don't give a, co a correlation coefficient, but it's very clear. It's never in the opposite direction. It's always in the predicted direction where the, the gender choices and the intuitions match the frequency uh, in the input. Now, let me just raise three possibilities about this, and then I'm going to stop and take questions from the floor. One is this. It could be that French speakers have simply forgotten the stages they went through when they were learning the language, and that at some point they figured those rules out. A French speaker down here saying, no. Okay? That's one possibility. Another possibility is this. Maybe they noticed specific examples. Okay? In each case, noticing the gender of the noun, recording that information, and also noticing the phonological shape, but making no connection between the two. Okay? And then at some point, by some unconscious process of pattern extraction or rule abstraction, a language de acquisition device extracted that rule and parked it somewhere in the mind. That could be. But there's another possibility. The other possibility is that native speakers of, Sp of, of French hear such forms, notice the forms, notice their phonological shape, notice the genders of many individual nouns, accumulate a storehouse of information full of particular examples, and never make any inductive leap at all. That's the answer that would fit a lot of current connectionist models like PDP, Parallel Distributed Processing, which is the lobby diagram that I give you at the end. The basic idea here is that information takes, pro takes place, information processing takes place uh, between simple units in neural networks, that you have interconnections, and that these interconnections are strengthened or weakened in accordance with experience, and each item sends excitatory or inhibitory signals to the others. And the result is that the network of units acts in the end as if it knew the rules, but the rules are not in there, except for associative weights distributed across the entire network. So that kind of approach would say, it's not that French speakers have a collection of unconscious rules. It's just that when they have to make a gender assignment for a new noun, they do so under the simultaneous, mutual, interactive, parallel pressure from everything that they have in memory. Similarly, in my case, producing a, a, noun, a non-existent noun like Marida, we would say it's not that my unconscious mind applied a rule, but simply that this form was produced under pressure from all similar examples in memory, including one that happened to be Arabic. In other words, as rather than uh, seeing unconscious mind as a collection of deep and elegant laws that look, would look something closer to what Freud thought, that is, a rather unruly collection of memories. I'll stop. I'll, let me summarize my claims. I've claimed that nothing in input becomes intake unless you notice it. So my answer to the subliminal learning question is, no, you can't learn that way. On the other hand, incidental learning is clearly possible. It is clearly possible to learn things without intending to learn them. Um, although it may not be possible to learn things without intending to if you don't have to carry out tasks that require you to attend to them, if you follow that distinction. Finally, the question of implicit learning remains unresolved. It seems to me that implicit learning is possible. Although the notion that this rests upon unconscious rules has been called into question. Also, I think that there's no evidence to reject the other null hypothesis, being that understanding and insight play no role in learning. It seems to me that for the most part, then the assumption that learning is mostly unconscious uh, rests largely on an assumption of ignorance rather than the investigation of awareness. Thank you very much. I'll take questions.
thinking of a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> This will satisfy you, but I, I really only made brief mention to the articulate report question. Um, it's often assumed that you, you don't know something unless, that you, unless you can say it. But phonology probably provides the clearest case of, of noticing things without being able to describe what you've noticed. Uh, you can notice an intonation pattern and have to take three phonetics courses before you can give a rough description of what you've noticed, uh, because what you're trying to describe is, a, is an acoustic image rather than uh, something represent, prop, represented uh, propositionally. So I certainly think you have to notice things. I make, I'm, actually, I'm willing to make these claims for uh, morphology, lexicon. I'm not sure about all aspects of syntax, but a lot of them. Uh, pragmatics. I think phonology, you have to notice it. If you don't notice it, you can't learn it. But that, it's another question entirely to say what you've noticed. Does that help? No? OK. Stuart. Uh, I hope I'm not going to miss both question, but I think what he said about this is that uh, about uh, learning and the acquisition, that uh, saying that um, saying that this is possible is based on studies done by uh, linguistically sophisticated people, like uh, you yourself learning uh, Brazilian or Portuguese. And uh, that for ordinary people, it doesn't happen. Right. What do you have to say about that? I think that's elitism, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. I don't, I, yeah. I, I often I'm told that, given that line, you know, well, linguists learn one way and uh, normal people another way. Well, how come linguists don't learn languages a lot better than other people? <laughs> that's one, one response I have to that. Um, I think I probably pay it, pay it, in this Brazilian experience, I think I probably paid attention more than a lot of other people. I'm not sure that I noticed more or understood more. My, the understandings that I report as being crucial are not very sophisticated ones. They involve figuring out what somebody is saying to me and what it means. Uh, so I think when I say, when I say understanding, uh, I don't mean very abstract understanding. Um, I, we, we can't in, unless we want to rule children out completely. You know? um, I think what happens is that people have fairly unabstract understandings, but as linguists, we prefer to present the rule in, its most, in the most abstract form possible. And then we assume that the rule must exist in the head somewhere. A simple example is, is this. English is an SVO language, so speakers of English must know that English is SVO. Ask them. Is English SVO? And you get a lot of stares. On the other hand, if you, if you, you know, why ask such an abstract question? If you ask them whether subjects come before verbs, you'll get a lot more correct answers. And if you ask them to, uh, if you present them with a sentence and say, who did what to whom, they'll be able to tell you. So they have the knowledge. But um, saying that there's a, there's a little rule parked in your brain someplace that says SVO, um, I think is attributing something too abstract to the learner unconsciously, then you demand something similar in what they can verbally report. Anyway, I think, um, uh, I don't think I learn differently from other people and may just have to, uh, there's a difference in the ability to describe it. Yes. Some aspect of features of a segment um, in order to 
the re uh, let me just comment. The reason I like that study is that it, more than some others, the reason I thought it was a better test case than uh, and in English is that English speakers learn in school about uh, and. Uh, and one of the nice things about that particular study is that they say they've searched the elementary school textbooks and they don't give a clue. Um, so, well, that's the best example I have of implicit learning of in that general area of language right now. I don't know how to answer the, the, the question about children. Um, in general, I'm, I'm leery of, of attributing, saying much about what's in children's mind, minds. Um, I'm certainly, see, I don't, also I don't see this account as being at all incompatible with a view that says that there's a lot you need to start with and a lot that isn't learned. So when you want to talk about features, It's already there and it's being brought to the task. Yeah. Sure. Maybe we can continue that throughout the weekend. Jackie. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to be difficult, really. But I, I'm trying to imagine how you would take the language that you have and the language that you have your approach and let's say it's a standard Chomsky approach to language acquisition. Um. Which doesn't talk about this or which which or where someone makes the claim right. that, that that there's no learning. Right. That there's no awareness involved with learning. And there's no awareness of learning, right? I mean it's not gonna be a galvanic skin responses, I mean, you know what have you thought about well, how you would um. Well, um, no, this is only part of a partial answer, but a UG approach often um, proposes that certain triggers are required, and then that all deductive consequences are drawn. Um, that has a problem with data whenever you see incremental learning. Okay. I'm predicting that triggers will only have an effect when they're noticed. And that ought to be uh, not conclusively shown, but it ought to be possible to, to gather a certain amount of evidence for that. How? By asking people to notice what they're, uh, write down what they're noticing while they learn. That's just exactly the problem. I mean, there, there, there's all of this, I mean, you're just talking about how native speakers don't know what it is they know or can't verbalize what it is they know. Well, they're not very good at it, but um, I, I, I think we have to make a better attempt to find out what people are aware of and experiencing while they go through learning a language, rather than assuming that nothing's going on. So uh, it may not solve the problem, it may not give a conclusive answer, but we would have more information rather than less. I would predict that the insight leads to restructuring, for example, but I didn't get into that because uh, someone else is giving a talk on restructuring. Uh, but, I, but I would not expect restruct dramatic restructuring without dramatic understanding in insight. Um, it seems to me that, that unconscious learning is not going to happen dramatically. It'll happen very slowly over time. And that if there's a big break breakthrough, it, probably indicates a breakthrough in understanding. Well, everybody's been very patient while I went over, way over time. Thank you for coming, and I hope you all enjoy the conference.